Welcome, everybody, and good evening. Um, on behalf of the Center of African Studies, I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2018 Audrey Richards Distinguished African Studies Lecture. Um, I'm Adam Branch. I'm the director of the Center of African Studies. Uh, this annual lecture, which is named after the founder of the Center of African Studies, has in the past been given by such distinguished writers and scholars as Chino Achebe, Simon Gikandi, Sylvia Tamale, James Ferguson, and Derek Peterson. Next year's lecture will be given by Akosua Adomako Ampofo. All right. <laughs> we picked a winner. <laughs> Excellent. Um, she's already agreed, too, so, yeah. And this year, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Professor Lungisile Nsebeza, who's the holder of the A.C. Jordan Research Chair in African Studies and is director of the Center of African Studies at the University of Cape Town. Professor Nsebeza obtained his B.A. in Philosophy and Political Science through UNISA and his honors in African Studies at UCT. He completed his master's degree in Economic History at what was then the University of Natal and a PhD in sociology at Rhodes University. His research focuses on three themes, democratization in the countryside, land and equity, and social movements in the land sector. He's produced a number of seminal works, including Democracy Compromise, Chiefs and the Politics of Land in South Africa, and The Land Question in South Africa, The Challenge of Transformation and Redistribution. In 2008, he was appointed the NRF Research Chair in Land Reform and Democracy in South Africa at UCT, and has since then built its Center for African Studies into a major international focal point for research on Africa. He was a key voice in the recent Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall protests in South Africa, and crucially helped to locate today's student struggles in their historical context, while also delineating their connections to broader societal movements, both urban and rural. Now, in addition to his engagement with rural sociology, Professor Nsebeza is pursuing a long-term research agenda right now on the intellectual history of Archie Mafeje. As I'm sure many people here know, Archie Mafeje received his PhD in anthropology in Cam from Cambridge exactly, well, not exactly, but just over 50 years ago, which was one year after the Center of African Studies was founded. Upon leaving Cambridge, Mafeje began a long and celebrated transnational career <coughs> as a university academic, public intellectual and political activist, while never losing sight of his home country of South Africa. It was this history that we asked Professor Nsebeza to speak about today, not only because of its immediate biographical relevance, but also because of its resonance for ongoing debates around decolonization and transformation of knowledge production on Africa, which has been a major theme of this year's work at the center. So I'm gonna leave it to Professor Nsebeza to speak more about Mafeje, but what I'd like to do briefly is to set a bit more about of the context here at Cambridge. So at Cambridge here today, like at many other UK universities, there's a flourishing of movements around decolonizing the university and decolonizing the curriculum. There are student-led decolonization working groups that have been set up in at least a dozen departments and faculties. There are university-wide meetings every few weeks to discuss theory and strategy of decolonization, innumerable workshops, conferences, talks, and seminars. Decolonization resounded during our recent staff strike and was a demand of the student occupiers of Senate House, which led to a declared commitment to decolonizing the curriculum from the new vice chancellor. From all of this, and all of this debate and um, efflorescence of, of, of conversations, a certain agenda has started to take place. One in which, as I see it, decolonization is understood to be the process of excavating the colonial origins and tracing the colonial legacies of our bodies of knowledge. It particularly requires attention to the institutions that produce and reproduce this knowledge, that enforce certain ways of knowing and as, of producing knowledge as authoritative. Then it means addressing those legacies explicitly, while taking seriously the specificity of what decolonizing might mean within the former colonial metropole. Now, movements in British universities are, of course, responding in part to the student movements in South Africa and also to anti-racist movements in the US around black lives. African studies, as I see it, thus occupies a crucial nexus in broader programs as decolonial and anti-racist activism pushes us to rethink African studies so that it can speak to, in Adomako and Pofo's words, quote, a time of Afro-revivalism as well as a heightened onslaught on black bodies globally. 
In our own Center of African Studies, we're trying to respond to this intellectual, political, and ethical call. Towards this end, with the very generous support of the Philomathia Foundation, we've created new MPhil and PhD scholarships from st for students coming from African universities. We've expanded our Visiting African Scholars and Postdoctoral Fellows program, as well as securing funding for major yearly conferences on pressing questions in African studies. Njoki Wamai and I convened a year-long public lecture series on rethinking African studies, and we hope to continue to support the crucial work of the Black Cantabs and the African Society. We're currently discussing reform of our MPhil curriculum and looking to use the center, as well as the newly formed Consortium for the Global South, as a site from where to insist that race, imperialism, and decolonization be taken seriously throughout the university, from where to affirm the existence of African intellectual production against long-standing silences, and to make the case that knowledge from the world beyond the West must be included in any curriculum that claims general or global relevance. In all of this, we're not alone. Similar movements are afoot at Oxford, for instance, where Center Director Wale Adebanwi <laughs> has made a clarion call for a global African studies. Now, what is happening today across uni UK universities is especially important because, from my understanding, there is yet to be a real institutional reckoning with the legacy of colonialism for British African studies. British African studies took shape in the early 1960s with the return of significant numbers of British academics from colleges and universities in newly independent African countries. The centers of African studies that were established in the UK at that time, including ours, were set up often by many of these returning academics. Some of them had directed or worked in colonial social science research institutes in Africa, most notably the East African Institute for Social Research at Makerere or the Rhodes Livingston Institute in Zambia. And so the UK's interdisciplinary centers of African studies may in part trace their origins to these colonial institutes of knowledge production about Africa, which were then re-imported from Africa to the post-imperial metropole. And I think it remains up to us to ask whether these origins remain stamped on our centers, on the institutions that we work in today. Now, intellectually as well, there are times when the particular idea of Africa as an object of knowledge that was developed in the colonial period can still feel alive within British African studies today. The anti-colonial, pan-African, and transcontinental traditions of African studies, with their focus on the African diaspora, race, and Africa-centered knowledge, were never really institutionalized within British universities, as they were within African and some North American universities. Although many African scholars critical of the Western tradition of scholarship on Africa, such as Mafeje, attended British universities, few, if any, remained within UK academia. The challenges to the white predominance and racialization of African studies that were erupting in the US by the late 1960s and that happened in African universities with independence and haltingly in South African universities since the end of apartheid have never really occurred here, to my knowledge. This is despite the existence of a major tradition of work by UK-based scholars on African diasporas, black and southern transnationalisms, and on race that could be a transformative interlocutor for African studies here. Instead, this tradition is largely overlooked. In all of the articles over the last 50 years of African Affairs, for instance, which is the flagship uh, journal of the Royal African Institute, Paul Gilroy is mentioned twice, Stuart Hall is mentioned in two footnotes. And so it's in this context that Lungusile and Sebeza's engagement with Archie Mafeje is so important for us here. It illuminates not only the history of British African studies, but also its intersecting histories with African studies in Africa, Europe, and North America. The research traces transnational political, intellectual, and personal trajectories that can show the lineages of colonialism in the past and present, and also help inspire conversations to chart paths forward critically and collectively towards transformation of African studies for the future. So with that, I welcome Professor Nsimbeza. Good afternoon, or oh, evening. Um, thanks, uh, Adam both for the invitation and for the introduction. It sets the context for my talk. 
The title of my talk is uh, Decolonizing African Studies, Revisiting Atomophagia on Theory and Method. The entry of university-based students in the political and social life of South Africa, which erupted in the open on 9 March 2015, those of you who are from UCT, a couple that I've seen, will remember that day. <laughs> when a university of Cape Town, UCT, student activist, Kumani, Makwele, flung poo onto the imposing state statue of arch imperialist and capitalist Cecil John Rhodes, which was mounted on UCT grounds, put the issue of decolonizing higher education, including African studies, high on the agenda. This seemingly single event set in motion a campaign under the auspices of the Rose Must Fall movement, later renamed Fees Must Fall movement, which not only demanded the removal of the statue which they perceived as signifying deep-rooted links between UCT and colonialism, but the decolonization of the curriculum. Other concepts such as Eurocentrism, Afrocentrism, were turned around. A number of universities, as well as elite American and British universities such as Harvard, Yale, Cambridge University, Oxford, joined forces with the UCT students and pledged support for the campaign. They clearly demonstrated that the protest was not simply a national issue, but was continental and global in its character. For some time, it was never clear what the meanings and significance of these concepts were. There's a situation very much similar to the 1976 Soweto revolts in South Africa that were characterized by militant actions and slogans without, as Manfeji himself would say, a clear program of action whose task it is to come up with clear, informed, and well-articulated positions and demands. However, in the three odd years since 2015, things are beginning to crystallize, at least at the level of the kinds of questions we should be addressing. At the heart of these questions is the thorny question of the study of Africa and its people. The question can be classified into broadly two categories. Research on the one hand, teaching and learning on the other. Regarding research, the following are typical questions that come up. Who should legitimately study Africa? Is this an exercise to be, to be undertaken by Africans only? If so, should it be undertaken by those who are based on the continent, or those in the diaspora, or both? What about non-Africans? For example, the so-called Africanists based in Europe, America, and Asia. There's a growing interest in African studies in China these days. Shouldn't forget that. To what degree, that's another set, you know, the other set of questions, to what degree does the physical location and origin of the researcher matter, especially given that African intellectuals themselves are a product of colonial education? How different will the knowledge they produce be from that produced by their counterparts outside the African continent? 
would or do Africans represent themselves differently from how others, non-Africans, represent them? The third set that I have here is what is the status of whites of European and American origin who decided to settle on the continent and regard the continent as home? I'm talking here particularly about South Africa. Here, the issue of race and racism, particularly in South Africa and Namibia, are crucial. And the last set, the last question you know, that you know, comes up you know, as I listen you know, to discussions and debates is, is it legitimate for Africans based either on the continent or in the diaspora to study others, for example, Europe and its people? Questions regarding teaching and learning revolve around the following. What is taught and which resources are prescribed and used? It's a big, big question. Who teaches and from what perspective? This is where you, know, you get these concepts, these slogans, Eurocentrism, Afrocentrism, and so on. There are also questions raised regarding the process of knowledge production, in particular, the difficulty African scholars face in accessing funding. Further, issues are raised of problems that African scholars confront in being published in so-called acknowledged peer-reviewed journals, on the one hand, or in having journals published on the continent acknowledged and accepted. These become stumbling blocks for Africans to have their material available as teaching resources. Reflecting on the above questions and the various attempts that are made to address them, I'm struck by the fact that they are sometimes presented as new questions. And there often seems to be no appreciation or knowledge that others had blazed a trail. I'm thinking here of the late Archie Mafeji, the focus of my lecture tonight. Mafeji was indeed a trailblazer in his criticism of anthropology in particular and the social sciences in general, in the era of colonialism and imperialism. In his preface to Mafeja's booklet, In Search of an Alternative, published in 1992, Ibo Mandaza, the publisher, commented that Mafeja was probably the first in that category of African and African diaspora scholars to provide us with a coherent account of the trajectory of African scholarship from its pan-Africanist roots. When I, I was asked for a title for my talk, it did not take me long to come up with this title. I am of the view that Mafeje is a useful sparring partner and a core thinker as we try and understand the present and imagine in our context of higher education, decolonizing the study of Africa, in Africa and elsewhere. Mafeje came to Cambridge in 1964. As a research student, he didn't immediately register for a PhD, but he later registered for his PhD in 1965. His supervisor was Audrey Richards, the namesake of this annual lecture. He completed his PhD at the end of 1968 to become a renowned scholar 
that Mandaza depicts about, above. Sorry. I argue in this lecture that it is here in Cambridge, in the five years he spent here, that Mafeja developed his thoughts that would make him one of the severest critiques of what he himself referred to as colonial anthropology and the social sciences. Before coming to Cambridge, Mafeje did his studies up to his master's degree in social anthropology at the University of Cape Town under the supervision of Monica Wilson, herself an anthropologist of distinction. Mafeje had during his time at UCT, confessed to Monica Wilson that anthropology was his calling. It's his words. Yet, five years at Cambridge, Mafeje had become very critical of anthropology. How this happened is part of what I'm exploring in the book I'm working on, on the intellectual and political life of Mafeji. In this regard, I cannot think of a better starting point than an analysis and reflection on his seminal piece, The Ideology of Tribalism, published in 1971, three years after Mafeji left Cambridge. Mafeji's starting point is that whenever authors write on Africa, tribalism is their point of departure. He raises the following key questions concerning why there's this reference to tribalism. Could this be the distinguishing feature of the continent? Or is it merely a reflection of the system of perceptions of those who write on Africa and of their African converts? Might not African history, written not by Europeans, but by Africans themselves, have employed different concepts and told a different story? If so, what would have been a theoretical explanation. Are things what they are called? Or do they have an existence which is independent of the nomenclature that attaches to them? Mafeja's argument is that tribalism is used as an ideological ploy to achieve ends which have nothing to do with it. According to him, the problem in Africa is not one of empirically diversified behaviors, but mainly one of ideology, and especially the ideology of tribalism. He expounds, and I quote him, European colonialism, like any epoch, brought with it certain ways of reconstructing the African reality. It regarded African societies as particularly tribal. This approach produced certain blinkers or ideological predispositions, which made it difficult for those associated with the system to view these societies in any other light. Hence certain modes of thought among European scholars in Africa and their African counterparts have persisted despite the many important economic and political changes that have occurred in the continent over the last 75 to 100 years. Of course, well, this was written in 1971, almost 50 years ago. For Mafeji, colonial authorities created tribes as political communities, a process that was helped along by the anthropologists 
preoccupation with tribes. It is this, according to him, that provided the material as well as the ideological base of what is now called tribalism. That's what it's saying. concedes that anthropologists may have been right in, in insisting that traditional or pre-colonial African societies, large or small, were tribes. They would have been relatively undifferentiated I mean, these would have been relatively undifferentiated societies practicing a primitive subsistence economy and enjoying local autonomy. However, Mafeje argued them that the minute such a society strives to maintain its basic structure and local economy, even under changed economic and political conditions, perhaps it can be said to exhibit tribalism. In the final analysis, Mafeja contends that tribalism may not, uh, may not matter, but the ideology of tribalism, peddled by both expatriate theorists and emergent African class ideologies, matter, matters very much. He emphatically concludes that if tribalism is thought of as peculiarly African, then the ideology itself is particularly European in origin. Mafeja strongly implies in this article that the ideology of tribalism knows no race. And I think this is an important point that we should keep in mind. Whenever he makes reference to the colonizer, or expatriate theories. He also includes the converts, the Africans, and what he calls the emergent African middle class idealists, ideologies. He notes that the modern African, who is a product of colonialism, speaks the same language as the colonizer. In this regard, he invokes Marx in the German ideology. And you know, the extract you know, that I have there is the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. That is, the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. There are two other points you know, that Mafeja raises in the article. No, the, 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 the final point that Mafeja raises in the article concerns language and terminology. And here he makes an, an interesting point that I think linguists might want you know, to pursue. His question, or he notes with interest, that the indigenous population of present-day South Africa had no word for tribe, and that the term only occurs when English is spoken. I thought about this. No, I consulted you know, linguists, people who speak Isikosa, which is the language Mafesha spoke, I speak, and so on. Really, we cannot find another word. And, uh, and one of my students was asking me whether there are any tribes in Europe or whether no tribes only are in Africa. That would be an interesting point not to, 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 to pursue. The ideology of tribalism laid the foundation for Mafeja's approach to theory and method. As I show in my 2016 article on the legacy of Arch Mafeja, his theoretical and methodological position is well articulated in his critique of fellow South African Marxist scholars, Harold Wolby and Mike Morris. And this, is, this appears in a review article that was published in a special issue on anthropology and history in the Journal of Southern African Studies. 
note this no, because I come back to this point. No, this is not a journal no, that's not known. It's a well-known journal, so he publishes in this journal in 81. The essence of his criticism, criticizing Holdi and Morris, is that their theories are based on texts which are largely devoid of context. He accused them of having hardly acquired ideographic knowledge through field work, presumably of their own, but they relied on work done by liberals, anthropologists, linguists, economists, and historians, as according to Mafeji. Central to Mafeji's critique is the distinction and or relationship he draws between ideographic and nomothetic inquiries, warning that to avoid being lost in abstraction, one should approach the general via the, spe the specific. He accused Marxists of disdaining fieldwork under the guise that abstract theory was superior knowledge than empirical research. However, Maferge noted that a general theory, nomothetic inquiry, was needed to make the, specificity, the specificity, specificities intelligible. Mafesha's insistence on the importance of doing field work and, and ethnographic studies is, despite his severe criticism of anthropology and anthropologists of his time, a clear testimony of the impact of anthropology on him. He clearly cherished that this aspect of anthropology. As Sharp put it, Mafesha remained faithful to Wilson's injunction that any attempt to understand the circumstances of people in Africa required first-hand inquiry into what they made of those circumstances themselves. What Pavese objected to was an anthropology in which, to quote Sharp again, particular epistemological assumptions were allowed to overwhelm whatever it was that people on the ground had to say about the conditions in which they found themselves. What about Mafeje in today's discussions? Close to 50 years after the publication of Mafeje's seminal work, The Ideology of Tribalism, we find ourselves grappling with more or less the same problems and issues he highlighted and tried to grapple with. I'll reflect on a few of these and also reflect on the time gap that questions are raised 50 years ago and 50 years later and we're still grappling with similar questions. Much of the focus in the aftermath of the, of the Froze Must Fall campaign was around race and the need to de-racialize the university structures across the board. The irony is that only three years earlier, in 2012, a commission on student admissions at UCT that I said on, decided by a majority decision to recommend that race be no longer used as a criterion for selecting students at UCT. The events of 2015 and their aftermath showed that we were wrong. The ghost of racism still haunts South Africa, including its universities. There was particularly in 2015 and 16 a flurry of debates and discussions 
largely in the form of opinion pieces in newspapers. There are notable developments on this front, positive development, particularly at the level of administration, and here I'm talking about UCT. For example, the VCT, I mean, I mean the UCT vice chancellor is male, but his deputy vice chancellors are female. One white and two black. The incoming vice chancellor is going to be a black South African woman. We do not know who is going to replace her. But for the moment, we know that at UCT, we have a leadership that is made up of women two black and a white woman. A lot has also been achieved at the level of the racial composition of students, but less so at the level of academic staff, especially, and this is worrying, at the professorial level, where membership to the all-powerful Senate is drawn from. As I said, this, is a this has serious implications for UCT policy. One significant development that is relevant <clears throat> and worth mentioning here was the establishment of an Archie Mafeje chair in critical and decolonial humanities at the beginning of this year. Its mission is to champion the production of new knowledge in and about Africa by conducting cutting edge research on Africa's historical present and on visions of the continent's futures. The establishment of the chair adds to a list of accolades that have been bestowed posthumously on Maferje as part of UCT's apology to Maferje and his family. Afeje was subjected to overt racism in 1968, whilst he was a student here. When his appointment as senior lecturer in social anthropology at UCT was rescinded by the University Council, he was again the subject of a subtle form of racism and ideological bias in the early 1990s, when he was not considered for the A.C. Jordan Chair in African Studies, the position that I'm currently holding. The Archie Mafeji Chair also compensates for an injustice done to Mahmoud Mamdani, the Ugandan scholar who was appointed in the position Mafeji applied for. Appointed in 1996 to lead the UCT transformation agenda, Mamdani was locked up in frustrating and energy sapping debates when he proposed a course on major debates in the study of Africa. This whole saga is fortunately for us published in our journal, the journal of the Center for African Studies at UCT called Social Dynamics. And it's the 1997-1998 editions. Mamdane officially left UCT in 1999 and for 13 years, up to my appointment in 2012, the AC Jordan chair was vacant and the Center for African Studies faced threats of being disestablished. It took the student-led revolt of 2015 and its aftermath to put African Studies and the study of Africa more broadly back on the agenda. Not only at UCT, but beyond, including, as I said, the Global North. 
It is early days to say how the Archie Mafeja chair will operate and how it will deal with the intellectual legacy of Mafeja. But the name itself is likely to prick curiosity amongst staff and students and make them read and conduct research as I do on Mafeja. It is indeed saddening that hardly any reference is made to Mafeja's work in current discussions on decolonization in South Africa. Whom Mdane had in 1992 described as the scholar that I depicted earlier on. This is the time Achima Fajr was making efforts to come back to UCT. We now know, and this has been recorded and eternalized, that UCT rejected him, thus losing a golden opportunity to transform itself at the dawn of our democracy in the early 1990s. This lost opportunity was acknowledged in 2008 by the current, who was then new, Vice Chancellor Dr. Max, Max Price, when offering an apology to the Mafeji family and an honorary doctorate that was posthumously awarded to Mafeji. This is what he said. We record, therefore, that significant opportunities were lost during the period of South Africa's transition to democracy to bring a very significant scholar home to UCT. In this, the university showed a serious lack of sensitivity. And it is a matter of profound regret that Professor Mofeja's life ended with these matters unresolved. At the time, UCT committed itself to finding tangible ways in which the memory, and I'm quoting you now the, the Vice Chancellor, the memory of a fine scholar of Africa might be acceptably and indelibly enshrined, both at the University of Cape Town and in the wider scholarly community, unquote. These came, these tangible ways, came in the form of renaming the Senate room after Mafeji, an honorary doctorate, and a named scholarship. Much as I was pleased with these tangible ways UCT expressed, I was concerned that the scholarly qualities of Mafeji were not acknowledged. Mafeji was first and most, first and foremost, an intellectual. And it is Mafeji, the intellectual, that must be recognized. Mafeji's work has been and continues to be marginalized, not least by fellow South African academics. One example that stands, that stands out is the article I referred to on the articulation of mode of production debate. His critique of Wolpe and Morris, published in the journal, they said, of Southern African Studies, went unnoticed. These were active intellectuals writing, reading, contributing to this journal, but they just ignored Mafeja's contribution. I'm not aware of any attempt that was made by Woolby and Morris to respond to Mafeja's criticism of their work. Few prescribe his work, and many of our students leave university after spending years without knowing about and having read the works of Mafeja. Of course, Mafeja, Mafeja is just an example that will resonate to many academics in South Africa and elsewhere. 
In one of his essays, Mafeje refer, I mean, reflected on the difficulties African scholars face. He partly attributed this state of affairs to, and I quote him, the attitude of intellectuals in the Northern Hemisphere who continue to rationalize their own desire to control and dominate by imputing that most of the research proposals by African radicals or non-conformists are unscientific or below standard. Given the fact that in such cases, the criteria for judgment are themselves in dispute, rationally, who is to say? Mafeshe asked the question. The issue, according to him, is not scientific. It has to do with racial superordination and subordination in an age of imperialism. Unquote. Mafeshe could easily have included South Africa, given the racial past and Eurocentrism that is a feature of our country. My hope, as the eternal optimist that I am, is that initiatives such as the research chair that has been established, and many others that are coming up, will, re will reverse this trend. We need new knowledge and new ways of producing that knowledge. Knowledge that is produced from the vantage point of Africans, as opposed to the production of knowledge on Africa and by Africans through jaundice Eurocentric eyes, irrespective of geographical location and racial background. I want to end this lecture by making a few observations based on the remark I made when I started this lecture, namely, how to explain Mafeja's radicalization from seeing anthropology as his calling to being one of his severest critiques. It seems clear in my mind that this radical radicalization occurred here in Cambridge in the five years Mafeja spent here, from the beginning of 1964 to the end of 1968. I find doing research on this critical aspect very demanding, simply because of the dearth of, res of resources and sources. An important source would be the personal files of those individuals who worked with Mafeja and the file of Mafeja himself. In all these universities that he was associated with, Cambridge, UCT, and Makerere University, where he did his field work in 1967, and was associated with the Department of Sociology and the Inst Makerere Institute of Social Research. My problem is that I'm struggling to get access to these sources. Of the university that Mafeji was associated, of the universities that Mafeji was associated with when doing his studies, only UCT, as far as I know, has guidelines for accessing personal finds of students and staff. I also rely on oral evidence. And here, once again, I have problems. There are very few people who know Mafeje here and in Uganda who are alive, and they are old. I have not managed to get much from them, but the search goes on. My 2016 article contains hints about Cambridge that would give us an idea 
of what I'm trying to talk about when I said that Cambridge Red Color is more fair. But I'm hesitant you now to dwell on this and make conclusive statements. More research needs to be done. And my hope is that you know, sessions like this can lead to fresh leads to get more data. But the limited resources at my disposal in the form of correspondence between Mafeje and Wilson and between Wilson and Richard suggests that Mafeje reacted to a certain kind of imposition that he would articulate very powerfully and eloquently in the ideology of tribalism. And here I want to use one source a letter that I also use in my 2016 article, written by Mafeji on the 10th of June 1970, that is a year before the publication of his article. And here is what Mafeji says. It's an extract, extract from this. Although personally, you are not to blame and in fact, you did everything to help. You are associated with my exp experience in Cambridge. Your frequent charge that I was ungrateful to you for the various things you had done for me did not make me feel any better. As a matter of fact, I began to wonder why you continued to help at all if that is what you felt about things. Whatever your complaints, one thing certain is that you knew from me that I was fully aware and appreciative of everything you have done for me. But for my own reasons, I was not going to allow myself to be adopted by anybody. The last sentence suggests that Mafeje was reacting against a certain attitude which he theorizes in his celebrated article, The Ideology of Tribalism. I thank you. <laughs>